Hello, my name is Akasemi Newsom, and I'm the Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies at UC Berkeley. On behalf of the Institute and our partner, the Pacific Regional Office of the German Historical Institute, I would like to welcome all of you to the first of two lectures this fall in German and European history at our Institute. Today, we will hear from Professor Udi Greenberg on Catholics, Protestants, and the origins of Europe's harsh religious pluralism. The next lecture in the series will take place on November 10th, so please stay tuned for further details. Now, these lectures would not be possible without the generous support of Mrs. Norma von Ragenfeld Feldman and the German Academic Exchange Service both of whom we thank. A few housekeeping details. After the lecture, audience members are welcome to enter their questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or to raise your hand with your video on. I'm now gonna turn it over to our moderator, Professor Stefan Ludwig Hoffman, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Akasemi, and welcome everyone. Um, our guest today is Udi Greenberg. Um, he is Associate Professor in the History Department at Dartmouth. Um, he received his PhD at Hebrew University and is the author of a um, landmark book that was published in 2015 called The Weimar Century. It was published with Princeton. And in this book, um, Udi showed and kind of also set the trend for several books that came after him um, to look at the legacies of Weimar in the Cold War era. Um, and he did this by focusing on um, emigres, German emigres, Weimar emigres that went to the United States um, and shaped political discourse on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, Udi was um, a fellow here at the Center for Religious Studies last year in Berkeley. I think he was also here as a graduate student working with Marty J. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and his stay in Berkeley was, I think, cut short a little bit by um, the pandemic. Um, so we are especially grateful that we can um, do the scheduled talk that was actually, I think, um, envisioned uh, for spring to do the talk today. Um, so welcome, Udi. Um, so there will be a 30 minute lecture by Professor Greenberg, um, and then we jump right into the Q&A. Thank you so much for this invitation and for the generous introduction for all of you for um, coming today. Coming My talk today is about the history of a very contentious terms, um, the term religious freedom. And in particularly, I'm going to talk about its recent history in Europe. Because over the last two decades or so, Europe has been rocked by a series of clashes over the meanings and the limits of the term religious liberty or religious freedom. In principle, almost everyone claims to accept this concept, the notion that all religious groups should have really, uh, the freedom to follow the religious customs as long as they don't seek to impose it on others. But increasingly, especially in the last decade, governments and courts across Europe have claimed that the notion still allows for blatant discrimination against certain groups, most commonly the Muslims minority. In Belgium, in Holland, in Austria, courts and politicians have claimed that religious liberty is compatible with, let's say, public bans on uh, headscarves in schools, permissions for businesses to fire workers who wear Muslim clothes, and the European Courts of Human Rights in series of spectacular reasons, um, rulings have approved all of those claiming that they are uh, compatible with the principle of religious freedoms in the last few years. All those trends have helped spark one of the most intense recent debates among scholars about the nature um, uh, of religious freedoms. What does it mean that religious liberty helps justify such ugly realities? Some scholars have argued that these recent developments show a betrayal or a tragic betrayal of the mission of liberalism. According to these scholars, religious freedom was one of the cornerstone, cornerstones of European legal regime since World War II and its transition to liberalism after Nazism. And it is, according to these scholars, the fading memory of the war and the resurgence of nationalism, especially since 2008, that ultimately um, 
are the reasons for increasing discrimination. More critical scholars have uh, instead argued that the problem is the very notion of religious freedom, which inherently breeds discrimination. Scholars like Talal Assad or the historian Joanne Scott have claimed that Western religious freedom is built on a very religious conception of religion as a personal, internal, private matter, which is no business in a private sphere. And they have argued that this notion is incompatible with other groups' conception of religion, like the Muslim minorities that express religious identification with collective symbols like the veils. And in their eyes, liberalism itself is discriminatory. It seeks to force minorities to conform to non um, to very Eurocentric conception of what is religion. In the talk today, I want to offer a different genealogy for this story. And I'm going to try and trace the story of religious freedom to a different story that is often forgotten today. And that is the end of the prolonged animosities between Catholics and Protestants, which is the topic of a book I'm working on right now. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, and historians know that well, Catholics and Protestant elites hated each other intensely, and they condoned legal discrimination against each other. But beginning in the 1930s, both groups radically changed their mind. They came to see each other as allies, formed interconfessional organization, and unleashed a process that is known by historians as ecumenism, of the end of the confessional conflict between Protestants and Catholics. And as I'll show, this process had very little to do with liberalism. It, is, it was a Christian response to Nazism, and it was an explicitly anti-liberal project. And it was in this context, is what I will try to show, that shaped how many Europeans came to think about religious freedom and the management of religion. It was an ideological project that was never about establishing religious equality to all, but about fostering a much more limited and hierarchical um, equality between Catholics and Protestants. So to make this point, my talk today is going to have three parts. First, I'm going to very briefly say a few words about Protestants and Catholics and how they justified legal discrimination against each other in the late 19th century and what is the ideological project behind it. Then I'm going to discuss the intellectual revolution that brought Catholics and Protestants together in the 1930s with a focus on Germany. And finally, I'll talk about how this story helps shape European thinking about religious freedom after World War II. And I will say a few words about how it helps us understand contemporary affairs. So let me say a few words about the background to the story. During the late 19th century and early 20th century, the animosity between Catholic and Protestants were powerful cultural and political forces in Europe, from France to Germany to Belgium, influential thinkers and a flood of publications attributed really every modern illness to the opposite confession. Um, Protestants, for example, blame Catholics for political subversion, for tyranny and for loyalty to foreign authority. Um, just to give one famous example, in 1872, the Belgian scholar Emile de la Vallée published a book entitled The Clerical Party in Belgium. In it, it argued that Catholics should be banned for participating in organized politics. And he argues that this is because Catholic lay people obey the priest, the priest obey the bishops, the bishops obey the Pope. Hence, the Pope is king and national sovereignty is ruined. This booklet sold 2 million copies. It was translated to multiple languages. And in English, it appeared with a special introduction by the British Prime Minister, William Gladstone, who was himself a very famous um, anti-Catholic. Other Protestants blame Catholics for the destruction of heteronormative sexuality. Here an example, in 1877, the Italian writer Luigi De Sanctis published an international blockbuster called The Confessional. And in it, he claimed that the purpose of Catholic confessional was to encourage married women to share their sexual fantasies. And in his telling, by fostering guilt among women, Catholic priests emotionally controlled women, undermined the authority of the husband, and ultimately undermined marriage itself. And Catholics, therefore, was an uh, Catholicism was an existential threat to what he conceived as proper gender relations. This topic has been covered a lot by historians, including by Professor Hoffman, but it is less known than how much Catholics also mirrored these arguments. And here an indicative example is a Spanish theologian called Jaume Balmes. In 1850, he published a book called Catholicism and Protestantism compared in their effect on European civilization. 
In it, he traced every aspect of European civilization, from economics to sexuality to either Catholicism or Protestantism. He claimed that Protestantism assault on the church led to the destruction of every foundation of social order. He also claimed that Luther's approval of divorce was responsible for centuries of sexual chaos and to the disintegration of the family and especially to the rise of early feminism. This book was one of the most popular works of the 19th century. It appeared in all European languages. The French edition had, uh, the French translation had 20 editions. The, Ameri the British English edition had 17 editions. And similar ideas circulated in thousands of books, pamphlets, speeches, and writers attributed everything from crime to economic development to either Catholicism or Protestantism. The most famous of those today is Max Weber's theory about the origins of capitalism and Protestantism, but that was just one of thousands of works in this vein. Now, why is this important to the story of religious liberty? This is because these ideas also had important political and legal consequences. All across Europe, confessional animosities routinely flared into public campaigns and often resulted in state discrimination. The most famous or notorious example manifested itself in Germany, where in the 1870s and 1880s, the Protestant majority launched a legal campaign against organized, organized Catholicism, expelling Catholics orders from the country or shutting down Catholic schools. But similar campaigns flared also in Hungary, in the Nordic state where the constitution of Norway banned Catholic organization from entering the country. And similar processes also operated in Catholic majority countries. For example, in both Spain and in Italy, there were prolonged periods in which Protestant churches, missionary works and so on were illegal. In fact, deep into the 20th century, this is for example, often forgotten, but, um, restrictions on Protestant life were integral to the Catholic Church agreement with uh, fascist Italy in 1929, and also to the agreement with General Franco a few years later in Spain. So very briefly to conclude this first section, this inter-Christian animosities were pervasive, a pervasive strand of European thought and culture into the 19th and 20th century. And those ideas deeply shaped how many Europeans understood modernity, then important imprint on the regulation of religion and politics in early 20th century Europe. So how did these ideas evaporate so quickly then in the 20th century? And how is that going to, um, how did that affect the history of religious liberty in Europe? For the second part of my talk, I want to focus on the intellectual revolution that undermined the power of these confessional tropes, both the political and gendered ones. And the point I want to make is this, this transformation began in the 1930s in Germany, and that it was deeply inspired by Nazism. One of the central but often forgotten components of Nazi ideology was its promise to end the denominational divide in Germany, which was two third Protestant and third Catholic and the country of the Reformation where the divide began. In its founding manifesto in 1919, the party declared its support for what it called positive Christianity. This was a new conception of religion that included all non-Jewish Germans or Aryans in the Nazi uh, lingo. For the Nazis, confessional unity was integral to the border project of establishing a unified racial body. And in Mein Kampf, there are long passages where Hitler um, reflects on the issue of confessional divide and the need to overcome it for racial unity. And they often claimed that this unity was also spiritual, which therefore made the Nazis the natural allies of the churches in their fight against secularism, socialism, and against feminism. Now, the Nazis were not the first time Catholics or Protestants cooperated in European history, but in the 1930s, when Hitler and his, had his electoral, electoral breakthrough and then came to power, the Nazi party became the first large scale movement that was interconfessional or ecumenical in modern European history. Now, historians have dedicated considerable energy to debating the level of actual affinity between Nazi ideology and Christian thought. There's ongoing debate about how similar they actually were. But what has gone less noted in this work is how deeply the success of the Nazis reshaped Catholic and Protestant thinking about each other and about the regulation of religion in the public sphere. 
in an effort to adapt themselves and to build bridges between themselves and the Nazi regime or movement, thinkers in both confessions also developed new ecumenical ideas and language that echoed and reaffirmed Nazi um, claims. The, just to give an example, the leading figure um, in Catholicism in this intellectual effort was a German writer called Robert Grosche. Robert Grosche in 1932 launched a journal called Catholica, which was designed to map the overlap between Catholic and Nazi thought. And many articles in it discussed, for instance, how both the Catholic Church and the Nazis shared longing for 1,000 year long Reich, a desire for collective redemption and a belief in sexual purity. But Catholica was also the first Catholic journal that was dedicated to engagement with Protestantism as equal. Specifically, Grosche and others argued that the community of the believers did not correlate to the body or the borders of the visible church, that is the Catholic church. Rather, it was comprised of all people who were baptized, whether they were Catholic or Protestant, and they were all members in what Grosche called the mystical body of Christ, a spiritual embodiment of a unified body. And similar ideas also began to circulate among Protestant thinkers. Here, a good example, perhaps the most significant figure was the Lutheran writer, Wilhelm Stellin. He was an ultra-nationalist, uh, anti-Semitic writer, later will become after World War II, the Bishop of Oldenburg, which is an important position in the Protestant church in Germany. During the 1920s, Stellin uh, was fiercely anti-Catholic. He published multiple essays that recycled the older claims about Catholicism fostering sexual promiscuity and anarchy. But during the 1930s, he reversed course quite sharply and he published multiple essays and books in which he echoed the vocabulary developed by Gauche. He argued that all Christians lived with what he called the mystical body of Christ, that only by actively celebrating the spiritual unified community could they could fulfill the mission of the gospel of establishing a Christian society. And he also added that Protestants and Catholics shared conception of family and marriage. He argued that even though they disagreed, let's say about contraception or the right for divorce, they had a deeper agreement about, the, about marriage being um, the only way in which sexual pleasure could be elevated to a new meaning by being uh, consecrated by God. And therefore he argued Catholics and Protestants should unify and organize a unified for, um, front against liberalism and against feminism. Now, to be clear, not all ecumenical Christians were Nazi sympathizers. Many of them had serious doubts about Nazis, especially about encroachment on church autonomy and education. Some of them had doubts about eugenics. Many of them would distance themselves from the Nazis after the first few years of the Nazis in power. But what all of them shared with the regime was a profound opposition to liberalism and to the notion of liberal equality of, and religious neutrality of the state. Just like the Nazi conception of a unified collective body, the concept of the mystical body of Christ was explicitly conceived as a hierarchical, unequal, and anti-liberal conception of community. And just to give an example for this affinity between ecumenism and Nazism, is this book written by a Catholic philosopher, Heinrich uh, Hans Eibel, who was a major Catholic thinker in Vienna in the radical right. In 1933, he published an ecumenical book called The Meaning of the Present. And in it, he argued that the confessional divide in Europe was the origin uh, um, emerged from Europe secular, was the origin of Europe secularization. He claimed that the break of the church authority led to apathy and secular liberalism a standard Catholic argument at the time. And for Eibel, this meant that the Third Reich and the ecumenical message of Christian unity presented a unique opportunity to reestablish Christianity as the center of public life and to establish it again as the privileged religion of Europe. And he enthusiastically, not surprisingly, also supported stripping all Jews of Europe from um, legal protection and all atheists. That is a reconfiguration of religious liberty as a very unequal that is the right to be only Christian. So ultimately, the Nazi promise to foster a revolutionary cooperation between Christians resurrected old hierarchies between Christians and others. The, um, this promise proved to be uniquely generative for ecumenism. 
while at the same time ending inequalities between Catholics and Protestants. And the political triumph of Nazism and its appeal to many Christian voters powered an unexpected intellectual shift. Now, I won't go to the, into this in detail today, but one thing to note is that even though ecumenism began as a German affair and as a response to Nazism, it quickly acquired European dimensions. The Nazis' success, first in crushing German communism and later in first years of conquering of all of Europe, for many, all of this seemed to demonstrate the power and benefit of Catholic and Protestant unity. Therefore, from the late 1930s and into the early 1940s, one can track the outpouring of interconfessional writing in France, in Belgium, in Slovakia, and elsewhere. Ultimately, also anti-Nazis uh, writers began to adopt its uh, interconfessional message. So just to briefly conclude this second session uh, section, the point that I hope to have made is that ecumenism in its origins echoed the very exclusionary and anti-liberal nature of Nazi ideology. It did radically challenge anti-Catholic and anti-Protestant tropes, that is, it was revolutionary, and it did develop new forms of religious tolerance between the confessions, but it did so in order to affirm other hierarchies, religious, political, and social, often very violent ones. So, this origin story about Catholic Protestant reconciliation, it can be a story of um, interesting historical curiosity or trivia, but how can it help us think about the issues with which I open the question of religious or, uh, pluralism and religious freedom in Europe? What does it teach us about European controversies about religion? In the third part of my talk, I want to say a few words on these questions. Because Catholic Protestant cooperation did not end with the collapse of Nazism, despite their earlier affinity or homology. Instead, the opposite happened. It emerged as one of the most powerful ideological projects of the post-war era. In the aftermath of the war, both Catholic and Protestant elites reaffirmed their commitment to confessional peace. Even though most of them now condemned the Nazis for their extreme violence and to their, for their biologism, Christian elites remain convinced that Europe's reconstruction and its future stability required forging of a broad spiritual community. And a major cause for this continuity was the flaring of the Cold War and the belief that both confessions needed each other in order to fight against atheistic Marxism, especially communism. This has been well covered and argued by other historians. But on a deeper intellectual level, the interest in ecumenism was ultimately premised on the shared notion that only Christianity could establish a post-war order that was based on natural, social, and sexual hierarchies. And in this intellectual world, other ideologies, such as socialism, liberalism, and so on, were all understood as slippery slope, which will ultimately lead to total secularization and chaos and Stalinism. This opinion was in fact so widespread among Christians that ecumenical efforts quickly coalesced into mass political movement. Across Western Europe, Catholic and Protestant politicians founded new interconfessional political parties called the Christian Democratic Parties, which were explicitly designed to unite Catholic and Protestants under one political roof. And here you can see a famous um, early pamphlet that brings Catholic and Protestant churches in uh, Westphalian together. And as was the case for the Nazis before them, the Christian Democrats message, which was that social order must be premised on confessional equality and traditional social hierarchy and anti-feminism and anti-socialism, it proved to be widely appealing. Christian Democrats won elections all over Western Europe and party leaders like Konrad Adenauer in, Germ in West Germany became the primary architects of Europe's reconstruction. Now, for the purpose of understanding religious liberty, what mattered most was the fact that it was Christian politicians and thinkers and who were the main architects of post-war religious, um, religious freedom laws. They were the ones who inscribed them into post-war constitutions, and they were the ones who defined how they should be interpreted. Why this matter is that because unlike what one might per, uh, perhaps would expect, the immediate post-war years did not bring full religious equality to Western Europe. Even though almost all post-war constitutions 
formally guaranteed religious freedom to all citizens, that is the right for free worship, many vestiges of serious confessional discrimination remained in the legal order of post-war Europe. In several uh, Protestant majority countries, for example, including all the Nordic states, the state funded only Protestant schools, but was banned from doing so for Catholic schools. In some places, like in Norway, um, the state continued to ban Catholic orders, charities, and organizations from operating in the country. Meanwhile, as I said, in Italy and Spain, Catholic majority countries, Protestants were discriminated against in marriage laws, in welfare laws, and were not allowed to worship publicly. In fact, the constitution of post-war Italy kept all the discrimination against Protestants that were enshrined in the Lateran Agreement between fascist Italy and the Catholic Church from the 1920s. Those were not abolished by the post-war constitution. But in the 1940s and early 1950s, Christian Democrats, writers, and jurists launched a campaign to end those inequalities. They drew in a massive wave of publications. They drew from the language of the 1930s and talked about how Catholic and Protestants were equal in the mystical body of Christ and therefore had to be treated equally under the law. The most famous achievement of this movement was the writing of the European Convention of Human Rights, which was uh, drafted in 1950 and came into effect in 1953 and ratified by most countries in Western and Central Europe. The convention has received a lot of scholarly attention over the last decade, and historians have often noted that one of the convention's most important clause was Article 9, which demanded that all governments would guarantee religious equality to all their subjects. And they have, many historians have noted that the impetus for this was not liberal, but it was conservative anti-Marxism. It was effort by Christian politicians to uh, protect their institutions against what they saw as socialist threat at home and communist oppression of Christians in other countries in Europe. What have gone less noted in this rich in scholarship is that another purpose of this clause was to achieve equality between Catholics and Protestants. And when governments across Europe com complied and revise the legal codes according to the convention, this is ultimately what they had in mind. For example, in West Germany, when the country ratified the convention in 1953, it was one of the first to do so, it removed, the first thing it did was to remove the last restriction on Catholic clergy, which by laws from the 19th century was still prohibited from discussing politics, a prohibition that was not on Protest true for Protestants. In Sweden, the response to ratification was that the government abolished in 1955 the prohibition on state funding for Catholic schools. And in Norway, the parliament, under, uh, after ratifying the convention, also revised its constitution to allow Catholic organizations to enter the country for the first time in 150 years. A parallel process also happened in Italy. There in 1956, the Supreme Constitutional Court, when it ruled on religious liberty for the first time, it abolished the restriction on Protestant marriage and evangelization. And it is, that is, when Europeans thought about the implementation of religious liberty, what they had in mind is ultimately equality between Catholics and Protestants. And it is important to note that nowhere were these shifts result of any demographic changes. Rather, they were all part respond to intellectual and political responses to new thinking about Christianity and its relation to uh, religious freedom. So in short, the ways in which religious freedom came to Europe did not have a lot to do with remorse for anti-Semitic violence. It had very little to do with compassion, new compassion to Jews or to Muslims. It also had very little to do with implementing abstract notions of liberal equality and state neutrality. Rather, it was a much stricter project of interconfessional, interchristian peace. It was the culmination of internal Christian processes that began only a few decades before in Germany. So to conclude this lecture, what does all of this mean to contemporary affairs? I think there are two things that merit attention. First, I believe that this story helps us grasp one important source for contemporary discrimination in Europe, one out of many. Unlike what Assad, Scott, and others have claimed, it seems to me that using religious freedom against Muslim is not necessarily rooted deeply in the history of liberalism as such or the theory of liberalism. Rather, it emerged from very specific project of mid-century Catholic Protestant peace, and it was never meant for other religious groups. 
Second, and perhaps less grim, the story I think may be a reminder of how malleable and shifting notions of religious liberty can be. A century ago, Catholic and Protestants in Europe happily discriminated against each other. And so no contradiction between discrimination against each other and religious liberty. But within just a couple of decades, they swiftly moved towards accommodation and remade the perception and the legal code of each other. Seeing such a project expanded toward agnostics, Muslims, and others would require tremendous creativity and political will, of course. But perhaps the historical record show that for all its ugliness, uh, the historical record can show that for all its ugliness, it can also be a reminder that such change is possible, even um, if it is happening under surprising circumstances. So that will be the end of my um, presentation. If there are any questions, I'm happy to engage. Thank you, Udi. Um, yes, so you could either um, write questions in the Q&A box or you raise your hand and I see it um, on the list of participants. I don't see you, you know, on my screen, unfortunately. It's too small, but I see whether you've raised a hand and uh, maybe to give you a moment to think um, about a question, um, let me ask one. Um, since my colleague John Connolly is not here because he has to teach, um, I was wondering um, how your account um, you know, fits with right. his account on, in From Enemy to Brother, a book that he published right. a few years ago um, that shows how Catholic teaching teachings about Judaism changed dramatically in the same time. Right. Um, and it did exact, I mean, his argument is in many ways that there was, you know, a moment of remorse, no? Right. Um, so it doesn't mean, you know, that both stories cannot be true at the same time. Of I course. would just invite you to say a few words, you know, about, you know, these tectonic shifts that are happening. On the one hand, you know, this ecumenical, um, move between Protestants and Catholics that is also part and parcel of, of um, fascism in Europe. Um, and at the same time, this reorientation of Catholic teachings on, um, on, on Jews. Yeah, that is an excellent question. And the work that by uh, John Connolly is, it's a masterpiece of intellectual history of tracing how groups of Catholic thinkers who fled Nazi Germany to Austria because they were converts from Judaism and therefore considered Nazi uh, enemies of the Nazis, how that experience led them to rethink about a uh, relationship between Catholics and Jews, to abandon anti-Semitism. And ultimately, uh, they were among the writers of Vatican II statement on the Jews where um, the church formally renounced, um, uh, renounced anti-Semitism. Interestingly, by the way, in the same, um, th that is less remembered, but uh, Vatican II was also the place where the church for the first time formally renounced its anti-Protestantism and embraced Protestants as brothers in faith, the term that the Catholic adopted. This may seem like those two processes are related to each other. What I've been trying to show in my own work and what the material I found in my own work is that those two processes are diametrically opposed to each other in the sense that Catholics and Protestants in Europe who embrace ecumenism, many of them were anti-Semites, many of them had long history of anti-Semitism, not all of them, of course, and many of them, the first impetus uh, for cooperation came from actually great admiration for Nazism and being excited about it. So the intellectual impetus for the project of Catholic reconciliation with Protestants and Catholic reconciliation with Jews is actually diametrically opposed to each other. I think also important um, in my conception of how I think about Christian thought and Christian politics, Connolly traced beautifully the work of a small group of theologians and how they shaped dogma in the church. My work is focusing not only on theology, but also on the writing of lay people, especially how they write about sexuality, about social theory. Most of the theoreticians, Catholicism or Protestantism in journals and books and so on, were lay people and not theologians. As far as I can see, the, that was the main preoccupation of the Catholic Protestant intellectual world and the engagement with Jews and the question of how you relate to Jews was fairly marginal um, among the non-anti-Semites, that is. Um, even after World War II, if you go through publications of Christian Democrats, of 
um, flood of publications among Catholics and Protestants about marriage and the relationship between Catholic and Protestant marriage and sexual and sexual theories and social theories and so on. There's hardly any comment about Jews. This is something that seems to be mostly a preoccupation of a small group of thinkers who are preoccupied with this and then insert it to dogma. And as far as I can tell, the story of Catholic Protestant engagement operates in different fields intellectually and has uh, different political dynamics that is the foundation of Christian democratic parties and Christian democratic missions and other organization that culminates in the 1960s that is unfolding in separation from the story of Judaism. So in that regard, even though it seems like those two stories should be related and if they are both part of the opening of the churches to more tolerant views of others, I think that um, the right story, at least when it comes to Catholic and Protestants, is a bit grimmer in many ways, or at least more limited. And I think that the Vatican II, which so many historians of Catholicism see always as a culmination of um, Catholic reform, is less important in that regard than we sometimes think. That, mm -hmm. that Vatican II is more of a stamping of approval that bishops do. And of course, it sometimes have reverberations among many. Uh, especially outside of Europe. But when it comes to inside Europe, it is just one event among many that happens. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. um, there's one question um, uh, by Jenner Akturk. Um, Jenner, do you want to ask your question yourself? I can allow you to Yeah, talk. if we're a small group, maybe people yes. can come. It would be nice to see people's faces uh, or hear their voices. Or hear me? I don't know if the- Yes, we hear we you. We hear you well. Yeah. You can hear me, okay. Um, I have uh, several interrelated questions, but the first one is, uh, uh, did uh, in the Nazi propaganda, did Hitler's origin as a Catholic Austrian who came to lead a majority Protestant and historically Protestant led Germany with the history of the Kulturkampf, etc., did that play a role um, uh, in this uh, overcoming of Catholic Protestant confessional divide, like, like through Nazism, you can kind of transcend your quote unquote underdog in, in German politics or society. Did it play a role in the Nazi propaganda? Was it at all emphasized in these interconfessional uh, polemics? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Um, the truth is that not only Hitler, who comes from, um, come from Catholic background, but also many other leaders among the early Nazi leadership that Joseph Goebbels was Catholic, um, Heinrich Himmler was Catholic, and that is something that was often publicized among um, the Catholic crowds in early uh, the early years of the regime. That is, in many ways, they were the embodiment, even though the, the Nazi party, most of its electorate was Protestant. There were a group of Catholic radicals who joined it, but largely it was still a Protestant movement. It was the only, though, extreme nationalist movement in Germany that was explicitly ecumenical and touted its leadership into a confessional background. Hitler himself often um, commented, again, and he drew here from his own early years, there's a lot been written about how Hitler's early years in uh, Austria and in Vienna in particular shaped his vision of anti-Semitism and so on. But much of what he was also learning at the time is he was observing a movement by Protestant Germans who crossed the border from Germany into Austria-Hungaria and tried to convert all Catholics into Protestantism in order to solidify the German sphere under Protestant control. It was called Away from Rome, Los von Rome movement. Mm -hmm. He often commented about how this experience was formative for him because it showed how tragic the confessional divide is for Germany, for the German speaking sphere. And he often used that to say how his movement is going to transcend it by showing the German nationalism is not foreign to Catholicism and that Catholicism is not foreign to German nationalism. So absolutely this background was important both for um, rhetoric and propaganda, but also as a formative experience for the Nazi leadership. Thank you very much. There's another question by Ignacio. Um, I'm allowing you to talk. You should be unmuted now. Oops. Hello? Oh, you want me to ask my question? Is that what? Yes, I yes. Oh, okay, I thought I had written it. So um, how does the, um, how does laicism, French laicism, 
work right. into your narrative because it 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 would it seems to me that a lot of the um, rhetoric um, surrounding restrictions on the expression of Muslim sentiment um, have uh, incorporate this this uh, notion of laicism and that you know France is not a country where religious expression should should um, should take place in public. Right. And um, so that's that's my question. No, that's an excellent question and a very important one. France is an interesting case. The vast majority of scholarship on religious freedom and its discriminatory um, impulse and so on has come from scholars of France. Um, especially John Scott has been particularly influential about this. One thing that I would say is that France in some way is not representative of the rest of Europe. It is, I think, the only country that has such a strong concept of laicite um, and formal secularism and state neutrality. And what I was trying to do with the project is to move our attention a little bit to other countries to see that the majority of them never embraced any such notion of secularism. When they talk about religious liberty, it's very clearly drawn from um, confessional conception of politics it is not neutral and never pretended to be neutral. And that is one thing I would say, but I think that the question of how laicite informs discrimination, it is true that today uh, when politicians pass legislation in France again to discriminate against Muslim, especially it's also gendered and against Muslim women mm -hmm. and their bodies, it's usually being um, explained as we cannot have public showing of religion in public. That was the logic behind the banning of the veils in schools. That was the logic behind the banning of the veil in the French parliament, for example, and it's being um, imitated in Quebec, which is heavily influenced by events in France. The reality is though that Les Cité lived quite happily in the post-World War II uh, period with the demonstration of religion in the public sphere. Right. It is there were many Catholic priests who were wearing Catholic clothes to schools and to the parliament. It was, there were Christian crucifixes in schools. And so on, as part of Catholic, um, making some sort of accommodation with an interconfessional semi-secular state mm -hmm. in France. So in many ways, the discrimination, what I would say is that the discrimination against Muslim today, as it uh, happens in France, it is rationalized and idealized, uh, explained as in adherence to the long history of laicite, but the reality is that it is um, there are forms of laicite in France that have not manifested them themselves. So it seems to me like like many historians have argued, we need to deep dig a bit deeper than to understand the origins um, of this discrimination, um, which has a lot to do, of course, with colonialism and the treatment of Muslims in Algeria. Any other questions? Um... I don't see any right. There is a question in the chat box. But, um... I think I answered it, right? Uh, I mean, we answered it. You answered it, actually. <laughs> um, There's a question about the colonies that I received. Oh, I, I, I don't have it in my Okay, maybe my it's from yeah. uh, Aksemi Newsom. Um, oh, from Aksemi, yeah. Aksemi. Um, do you want to unmute yourself, Aksemi? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Udi, for that excellent presentation, a lot that I did not know. So my question uh, would be, could you say something, Udi, about the transition from animosity to ecumenical unity in the 1930s and how that took place in uh, the colonies? Right. And I'm wondering if the Catholic and Protestant missionaries or any thinkers with tours in the colonies played a role in these debates. And then I guess also related to that, were colonial subjects able to gain from this transition in any way? Thanks so much. That's a fantastic question. I thank you for this. Um, in many ways, one of the last chapters of the book as I conceive it now is about the colonial um, impact, the impact of decolonization on the Catholic Protestant divide. As far as I can see, and the book traces the role of imperialism and colonialism in the confessional divide. That is something there's not much scholarship about, but um, Catholic Protestant animosity had sky was skyrocketing in the late 19th, early 20th century, in part out of con uh, belief that the imperial expansion after the uh, Berlin Conference also meant that access to the most of the world's population was now in competition against the other confessions. There are multiple publications that explain um, 
why the fate of Catholicism and Protestantism now lies in the colonies and in evangelizing um, the colonial subject as quickly as possible. So it was part of the fuel behind Catholic Protestant animosities. In the 1930s themselves, I haven't found a lot of um, either missionaries or colonial subject to theorize uh, about ecumenism. As far as I can tell, I think, in, um, I don't know if it's because cutting of communication lines to Europe through part of the war or other reasons, but I haven't found much of this. What I have found is that immediately after World War II, especially with um, the, the unfolding of decolonization, first in Asia and then in Africa in the late 50s and early 60s, there's a boom of interconfessional theories in the missionary world. These all uh, important missionary theoreticians start writing about the need for Protestant and Catholics to cooperate against each other, uh, with each other. And there's also probably among the most um, important far-reaching institutional cooperations between um, charities, between missions, between schools and so on, all out of the fear that the coming of decolonization and the collapse of the uh, protection of, um, of European empires, what will happen is that schools, um, missions and so on will be nationalized by newly states, some of which had clear socialist or secular um, leanings. So there's a massive explosion of missionary writing uh, by Europeans in the, in the colonies that argue that the time have come for interconfessional cooperation in order to protect Christianity in a world where it's clear that it's no longer going to have a privileged position in the state. Um, so what I say is that the timeline, at least as far as I can track thus far, is that uh, it happens mostly in the 50s and 60s in um, the colonies. And it's certainly the case that many colonial subjects utilize this and um, appropriate this language as part of, um, of an effort to indigenize, what they call indigenize the churches, to introduce new forms of rituals, of theology, new rules about marriage, about conversions, and so on. That they all argue that if Catholics and Protestants are so similar and are ready to negotiate and to find peace and um, recognize each other weddings and so on, then they should be the same with other local traditions and religions. So there's, um, there is certainly a colonial and post-colonial element to this story. So I thank you for bringing this up. Yeah, I should add that um, Udi uh, published an article in the American Historical Review uh, last year that also talks a little bit about the collapse of empires and how this is part and parcel of, of what you are describing, right? Yeah, and I would add that, interestingly, all those writers, they borrowed, they, this is when you see confession, um, colonial writers um, and missionary writers borrow directly from the publication of the 30s and the 50s. They use the same citations, the same text, the same terminology. And they also maintain the marine focus that is about social theory and about marriage and sexuality, which is why it was, I opened with these. And it's things that I try to repeat, um, come back to what they care about the most is how those things are going to function under new international political conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, Zena has another question. I'm unmuting you. I, I don't want to uh, read it myself. Um, did it work? Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me a chance for a second question. I wonder if the post war ecumenical Christian democratic project was still more appealing to the Catholic majority polities or Catholic led parties more than Protestants. And the reason I'm asking is because. During the presentation too, I mean, Konrad Adenauer, CDU, CSU, Italian PMs, Belgium, these are all uh, Catholic majority. So what I'm basically saying is, is there a similarly strong tradition of ecumenical interdenominational Christian democracy in, for example, Protestant Scandinavia or the United Kingdom? Or is there some sort of elective affinity between this uh, tradition and Catholic majority polities in particular? If I may just add one, uh, bit about European unity too, because there is, you know, writing about the foundations of the European Union and it's Catholic, like Catholic undercurrents and underpinnings of uh, the originally six uh, EU member states, which were all overwhelmingly Catholic, of course, without UK or the uh, Protestant Northeast. So uh, this is what uh, your presentation brought to my mind. Thank you very much for giving me a chance. 
Thank you for this great question. So yes, um, absolutely. It's clear that where interconfessionalism at its greatest political triumph was in um, in Italy, in France, in Belgium, that were majority Catholic. In Germany, um, the story is uh, in West Germany. It was a bit different. It was more confessionally uh, equal, 50-50, Though the majority of the votes for inter for the CDU or for the Union came from the Catholic voters, just because rates of secularization of abandoning their churches were much higher among Protestants. That is also true for the Nordic state and for um, for Great Britain. It is certainly true that um, interconfessionalism seemed to have been stronger in the 40s and 50s in uh, continental Europe. I think, as I said, it has a lot to do with the experience of Nazism, occupation of Nazism, and inner transformation that it generates um, in them. And I think a lot to do with genuine fears of uh, communist occupation in the early Cold War. And the uh, Nordic state and Great Britain, as far as I can tell, joined the story in the 1960s, early 1960s. This is where first you see interconfessional conferences, organizations, and movements, and, Catholic, um, and meetings of senior um, clergy, and so on. As to the comment, um, the scholarship that has come to say about the European Union and the EU, I'm a bit more skeptical about this um, scholarship. It is clear that um, the Treaty of Rome and some form of integration was stronger in the Catholic basis, um, the Catholic majority or Catholic led continent, and that Britain and the Nordic states remained a bit more hesitant about it until later. Still, there was pre um, multiple forms of cooperation um, and inclusion the example that I gave, the European Convention of Human Rights encompassed also the, North, the Nordic countries and Great Britain, which, as I said, revised their um, legal order in order to accommodate some of its clauses on religion. So there is some um, cooperation there. Also, I think that the, there's a tendency in scholarship to draw a very direct line between the internationalism of the early European community and the European Union. Um, the reality, though, is that this cooperation internationalism were still very, very limited in the 1950s. And, um, you know, in the 1950s and 60s are still Europe of the nation states. And the cooperation is still very, very limited. And the cooperation that we will see in what we call the European Union today is something that develops first in the 70s and then again in the 90s and 2000s. So I'm skeptical. It's true that Catholic-led countries were the at the forefront of first step of integration. But I think we often as historians read a little bit too much of contemporary integration back into the past uh, and a bit overemphasize the significance of this integration. Um, so I hope that that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much for both of your answers. Any other questions? Um, we have five more minutes. Um, if there are no more questions, then I might ask one. Um, okay. Um, well, what is so exciting, but also challenging with your project is that it's both a European story, but at the same time, it plays out differently in different countries, right? Um, and so I was wondering when, I mean, your starting point or end point is contemporary intolerance um, against religious minorities in European countries like France and Germany. Uh, and I wonder how much, you know, this intolerance can be explained by the shared history, by things that you show, you know, are shared, yeah. um, and how much um, depends actually on very different trajectories. Um, right. The question about laicite pointed in that direction, yeah, that the French, um, uh, story has its peculiarities right. that don't map on to the to the to the West German story. At the same time, you have increasingly these European institutions that try to, you know, um, literally unify um, how religious liberties, for example, are managed. So I was wondering how you know how you navigate this. this um, that's a phenomenal, um, phenomenally important question. Thank you for this. I think like all work that are try to do some show a phenomenon that crosses 
um, borders, it comes with the drawbacks of um, not being able to give as much place to the national or regional peculiarities. I think that um, that is true certainly for this. I think that it is true, for example, for the earlier parts of the story, whether it's anti-Catholicism and anti-Protestantism. On the one hand, the social basis of anti-Catholicism or Protestantism in Germany is very different than, let's say, Belgium or France, where Protestants are 2% of the population. But in, Protest in Germany, it's on, there are 70% of the population in the 19th century. The reality, however, is that there are shared tropes and the texts are being translated and constantly translated and utilized by people. Catholics read anti-Protestant texts from Germany, translate them and discuss them. And there is a shared vocabulary and image and language um, that is, you know, in some way like anti-Semitism. It's anti-Semitism, we all know that it has different variations across Europe and uh, important local variations, but it's also true that we cannot understand anti-Semitism just as a Polish phenomenon or German phenomenon. And we have to also think about um, the transnational context. And that's what I was trying to do with this project, in particular in, the, in a book where you have more space that you can get a little bit more into the nuance and the different trajectories. That's why I said that, you know, interconfessionalism, it doesn't start everywhere at the same time. It starts in Germany in certain moments. It spreads to the rest of Europe in certain moments. It reaches in Britain and in all the countries under different conditions than where it started and it reaches the colony or the missionary world under different conditions um, and which are the conditions of um, decolonization. Um, so in the book, I try to show the different moments and different trajectories, but also to map the similarities and the ideas and texts that are circulating across um, areas. And when it comes to today, like you said, you know, when the European Courts of Human Rights has to rule, for example, as it did two years ago, about whether it's legal for Belgium to allow business owners to fire workers with Muslim clothes, especially, of course, only, especially women. When it has to rule this question, it does not think just about Belgium. It has to think about what are the implications for Germany and to France. And when it rules, it has implications for Germany and to France. And when people bring litigations, um, to the court. It's not just because they try to reverse what happened in the nation state, but which one they want to reach what they see is a problem of a European uh, proportion. And even though, of course, each country has its own stream of immigrants that come from different areas and it has its own tradition of relation to Islam, especially the case of France and its colonies in Algeria are very different than the story of Germany. Um, there are also shared ideas that, and I'm trying to highlight those, but uh, of course, to be super responsible, one has to also highlight the differences and the different trajectories, um, which I hope the book will do. I hope that that answers your question. Any other questions? If not, um, let me just thank you. And we are looking forward uh, to reading the book um, soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for this generous hosting and for everyone who came. Thank you very much.